Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Hello, salam, and welcome to hashtag What the Patriarchy, where we are working to completely uproot the patriarchy from Islam. Hashtag inshallah, hashtag I promise we got this. This is Shahnaz. So we're back, continuing our summary of Kisha Ali's fantastic book, Sexual Ethics and Islam, Feminist Reflections on the Quran, Hadith, and Jurisprudence. And this is the 2016 edition that we're talking about. It was originally published in 2006. So far, we have covered three chapters of the book on marriage, divorce, and slavery. And in this episode, we'll cover chapter four, which is on illicit sex, quote unquote, haram sex, zina, for example. So the chapter is called Prohibited Acts and Forbidden Partners, Illicit Sex in Islamic Jurisprudence. Fit. What we're going to talk about in this video and what the author covers in the chapter are, among other things, the following. What is zina? What even makes zina unacceptable morally? And what makes a marriage morally acceptable? Then we'll talk about the punishment of zina. We'll talk about the discrepancies between classical fiqh ideas on sex and sexual ethics and today's Muslims' ideas on sex and sexual ethics. We'll talk about sexual desire and especially, of course, female sexual desire and a whole bunch of other things like polyandry and DNA testing and... Of course, you also get my very important opinions on the insecurity of too many male scholars and male fuqaha and how corrupt the fiqh is and the many times that it contradicts the Quran because hashtag male privilege. Okay, so what even is zina? Well, zina is sexual intercourse between two people who are not legally and Islamically permitted to each other for sexual purposes. We've established already what legitimates sexual contact and that would be the mahar slash the dower, the thing that the husband gives his wife at the time of marriage, or purchasing the person that you're about to have sex with. So enslaving someone. This is, again, according to fiqh, not necessarily according to Islam. You understand, of course, that my definition of Islam is not limited to fiqh, and fiqh doesn't break or make Islam. Islam is much grander, it's much more profound, and it's far beyond the fiqh. Plus, fiqh changes all the time and is, by definition, not binding. We don't have to agree with it. We don't have to live by it all the time in all contexts. And that's because fiqh literally is the interpretation of the Sharia. And historically, it's been a select group and class of people, men, actually, a select class of men whose interpretation of all things Islam survived. We'll talk about how that happened in a different episode. We'll also talk about the relationship between fiqh and sharia in a different episode. But for now, you can just think of fiqh as men's interpretations and opinions that are not always correct and often contradict the Quran. And that's because Islam cannot be limited to the Quran alone either. And these opinions change all the time because fiqh is still happening and it's literally a human, historically a very male endeavor. So back to zina. If zina is immoral, what makes licit sex, halal sex, moral? In fact, is zina sinful or immoral because there was no dower, no mahar involved? The point is, what makes an Islamic marriage moral? What determines, what factors determine that sexual access to another person is legitimate? The author asks an excellent question here. Does the dower and unilateral access to divorce by the husband make marriage moral? Are those the factors, the unilateral access to divorce by the husband only? And the dower, are those the only two factors that determine that the marriage is legitimate, is halal, is moral, morally acceptable? Is religious marriage like nikah, but no involvement from the court or no registration of the marriage sufficient to make sexual contact between two people licit, halal, acceptable, permissible? Where does the lawfulness of marriage rest? And my personal favorite question, what is God's stake in marriage? Why is God so invested in marriage? Our answers to these questions can tell us a lot about our own sense of ethics and sexual ethics in particular. They may not tell us as much about the Islamic sense of sexual ethics, however. Of course, the classical ideas on marriage and sex aren't compatible with our ideas today. And we're not talking just about classical Islamic ideas, but also non-Islamic, non-Muslim ideas too. You see, like other ancient Near Eastern and Medi Mediterranean codes and laws, historical Muslim texts and Islamic laws too, to quote the author here, held the view that the individual status of a legal relationship between two parties determined whether sex was licit. And this is on page 73 of the second edition. So a person's status as free or enslaved, uh, their status as the enslaver or the enslaved, 
their marital status, and of course their gender and sexual orientation, etc., are the things that determined who another person had sexual access to and whether they needed the person's consent in order to have sex with them. Like ancient Greek, Roman, biblical laws on sex, in the fiqh too, the man and the woman are not equal in their access to sex. The man gets to have up to four wives, an infinite number of concubines, and an infinite number of muta wives, by the way, all simultaneously. The woman in the meantime can have sex with only one man, her husband, or someone that she's in a nikah or a muta with, or her enslaver slash master. Clearly, I don't agree with the male fuqaha that only men can have multiple sexual or romantic partners or spouses, because fun fact here, the Quran actually does not forbid polyandry. And it was a thing before Islam in the Arab cultures, and it was pretty common historically, and it's still legitimate in some parts of the world. But how would polyandry work, you ask? Well, you see, while the men of fiqh pretend like it's all about lineage and stuff, how will we know whose baby it is, for example? That's actually not an Islamic obsession. That's not something that God is invested in at all. In the past, as well as today in communities that have polyandry or women having multiple sexual partners at one time, there are systems in place to take care of the question of whose baby it is. One system is not to care at all about whose baby it is because the baby or the child is believe, believed to belong to the whole tribe, the whole community. Everybody takes care of this baby. This is everybody's baby. Another is to designate somebody in the community who decides whose baby it is and the leader's decision is binding. And of course, in the 21st century, like today, we have DNA testing. The point here is that when you say something that you think is so brilliant, like the reason that women can't have multiple sex partners is because how will we know whose baby it is? It's actually not as brilliant a comment as you think it is. There are answers to the question of lineage and paternity if you want those answers and also can menopausal women or infertile women or women who have opted not to have children go ahead and have multiple sex partners because you know there's no issue there of children or paternity or lineage and so on and if your answer is no then you never really cared about the question of children or lineage really. So this whole unequal access to sex being determined by your status as a free or enslaved person or your class, basically, and your gender? Yeah, I'm not so convinced that that's established by the divine. It's established by exactly the same folks, the same men, who are then able to benefit and profit off of these corrupt and unjust conclusions. Oh, I should probably make it clear that what I'm just saying now about sexual access and the corruption of and the profiting off of these corrupt ideas is me talking and not the author. She doesn't talk like this. And so the reason that these classical ideas on marriage and sex aren't compatible with today's ideas on sex and marriage or sexual relations among Muslims is that, for one, the historical scholars allowed slavery and they allowed sex with the enslaved woman. And while today we hopefully agree that sex with an enslaved person is by default rape, you should know that the historical scholars actually did recognize the importance of consent, but they claimed that the consent of the concubine or the woman that you were enslaving was not needed for sex or for whether the man could ejaculate inside of her, possibly making her pregnant. They did debate and mostly agree that a man needed his free wife's consent, the free woman's consent in order to have sex with her and or to ejaculate inside of her, but not if the woman that the man was having sex with was a slave, was an enslaved person. And besides slavery and sexual relations with enslaved women and essentially raping uh, enslaved women, they also allowed child marriage, forced child marriage at that. You should read my dissertation for more details on this. And today, officially at least, both of these things, slavery and child marriage, are legally unacceptable pretty much everywhere in the world even if the age of consent varies dramatically from country to country. And today we also largely, not necessarily universally, agree that consent plays an important role in the morality of sexual activity. It's not the only thing that, that matters, and it shouldn't be the only thing that matters, but it plays an important role, and it's kind of a big deal. Also today we have informal alternative kinds of marriages or sexual access to other people than the permanent by intention marriage kind like nikah. There's muta for example which is often translated as a temporary marriage but you should know that there's a big question mark 
with the word temporary because it can range from any from a few minutes to literally 99 years um, and it's something that is considered very very shi'i but a lot of sunnis also partake in this and sunnis did not always historically consider it a haram or something unacceptable muta is a time-bound marriage that the woman too can initiate by the way big deal there's zawaj al misyar or marriage in transit where it's a travel marriage where you marry somebody temporarily while you're traveling because you don't have access to let's say your spouse and through a travel marriage you end up having access to somebody that you're not legally married to but you marry them temporarily and this spouse the, the spouse that you get from a misyar marriage does not have the same rights and obligations etc as a spouse through any does. and there's zawaj orfi a customary marriage it's a religious marriage that is not registered with the court and it may even be a secret marriage but you want sexual access to someone and you marry this person but you can't afford to honor the social financial legal practical and other obligations that come with a marriage oh let's talk about sexual desire now sexual desire is totes legitimate in the quran the hadith and the fiqh and you can even desire someone that you don't have islamic or legal access to but that doesn't mean you go and have sex with them for instance you might be married to a to person a and you sexually desire person b but that doesn't mean you go and sleep with person b we're not talking about same-sex relations here we'll do a separate video on same-sex relations which is coming up in a different chapter in this book that means that instead you go and look at them once okay sure but then you go and have sex with somebody that you do have sexual access to like a spouse or if you're in the past according to fiqh, not according to Islam, the person that you're enslaving. I do not endorse this. I think this is absolutely immoral and unethical and, unex and unacceptable. And having sex with your spouse, especially in this case, will be rewarded by God. And it's a form of worship since you're doing it within the limits that God has placed on you. And speaking of sexual desire, the fiqh recognizes female sexual desire. And so do Muslims and so does Islamic literature, which reminds me you should read this really fantastic book by Pranilla Myrna, about basically female sexuality and female desire and even same sex female desire and activity i did an interview with her and i'll put um i'll put the link to the interview in the description of this video so you can go ahead and listen to it as for the punishment for zina it's equal in the quran for women and men a hundred lashes but it's not equal for enslaved and free people the punishment for an enslaved person who commits zina is quranically half that of the free person, which should tell you that the, the punishment for zina can never possibly be, including for adultery, stoning to death. Not a Quranic thing, by the way. The Quran doesn't mention stoning to death, but the hadiths do, and the assumption of the in the Islamic legal tradition has been that married people committing zina or adultery in this case are to be stoned, but non-married ones are to be lashed. Stoning someone to death is a biblical punishment for various offenses, not necessarily for or exclusively for sexual offenses. Now, since humans, and I mean men here, decided that adultery warrants stoning as a punishment, they also had to come up with the specific guidelines for how that would work. So the fiqh then gives us a detailed and very, very stringent set of guidelines for what counts as proof of somebody having committed adultery. So for example, there must be four eyewitnesses and only adult male Muslim people count as witnesses and don't worry that's not a Quranic thing who must be able to testify to having witnessed penetration it's not just like okay two people were lying in bed together so we assume they must have had sex no you have to have literally physically witnessed penetration the idea here seems to have been to completely avoid giving the punishment and if they are found to be lying or if anyone accuses a an innocent a woman of zina, then the accuser gets almost the same punishment that a person who has committed zina gets in the Quran, 80 lashes. Also fun and significant fact here, even if a man sees his wife in bed with another man, he cannot take the law in his own hands according to fiqh and must produce three eyewitnesses to the act. And if he can't, then it's his word against his wife's word and the Quran tells us that if his wife says that she didn't do it by swearing four times then she didn't do it and her word has to be taken here and this even if the husband too swears four times that he saw it and that he's not lying still 
the wife's word is what counts in the Quran, not the husband's words. We'll talk about female testimony in a different episode, but this is a huge deal that the wife's word is taken against her husband's. The fiqh, however, because of course, adds that the husband who is accusing his wife of adultery has the right to deny paternity of any children in such a case and is not required to take care of them. The woman is entirely on her own. And that's, of course, because the men of fiqh are obsessed with paternity and male lineage and maintaining male privilege through the father's lineage like that. You understand? I have opinions about men who invent laws based on their personal whims and emotions and insecurities, but that'll have to be a separate episode another time. Just know for now that we do not have to trust any of the stuff that comes out of systems this desperately obsessed with male lineage. Now let's talk about the contemporary Muslim. I'm not going to go into detail here, but the author talks about the implications of new technology like DNA testing to determine paternity and whether this is necessarily a good thing for women. Basically, one of the most influential things in Islamic ethics is the don't ask, don't tell policy. So basically, if there's no incriminating evidence to delegitimize, and I hate this word, a child, then don't go searching for it. So the author explores some of the challenges and the challenging questions that arise from essentially combining two different systems, the historical classical Islamic legal system and a contemporary modern civil judiciary. So as we can imagine then, Muslims today are facing a crisis of sexual morality. The author does wonder if today's Muslims can do away with the patriarchal and sexist limitations of both historical and contemporary double standards while also acknowledging that there needs to be some boundaries to sexual relationships. Basically, the existing laws that we have are sexist and classist, and they need to be done away with and replaced with more egalitarian, less sexist, less ideally non-sexist, non-patriarchal ones, but in such a way that we can still have boundaries within sexual relationships. An obstacle to talking frankly and productively about illicit sex, like premarital sex, is that there's a general refusal to even admit that there's a problem to begin with. The don't ask, don't tell ethic that I mentioned earlier is both a good thing and a bad thing. Good in that it discourages people from probing into other people's private affairs in order to incriminate them, but also bad in that it prevents people from having an honest and necessary conversation, such as one about the fact that many Muslims are not waiting until marriage to have sex. And because illicit sex is considered sinful, Talking about it openly supposedly means that you are revealing someone else's sins, and that's not cool. But, the author notes, that only means that the problem will continue because premarital sex is taking place in high numbers, especially as humans wait longer to get married than ever before. And also, of course, the social, not Islamic, double standard of, say, male virginity versus female virginity means that the consequences of not talking about this issue openly and not taking it seriously are much worse for women than for men, even if they are treated or viewed as leg uh, legally as equals. In the coda of the chapter, the author talks about some recent cases or changes related to sexual ethics and quote-unquote illicit sexual relations, many of which focus on punishing women more harshly for breaking quote-unquote Islamic legal rulings. And as the author analyzes them, one thing that she says that I want to quote here is this. Rethinking Islamic law without questioning its basic presumptions about male dominance will not take us nearly far enough. Page 95. In other words, we have to acknowledge and do something about Islamic law's basic presumptions about male dominance, which harm women in many, many ways such as when it comes to, say, the kids and the kids that they might bear out of wedlock or in marriages that are not recognized by the state or by classical fiqh Islam, and of course, in a lot of other ways too. By the way, the coda for this chapter is one of my most favorites ever. I love the author's writing style, and she has a very professional way of speaking and writing, and her tone is always professional. But I feel like in this coda, there are certain phrases and sentences that she writes, like score another one for patriarchy, that are so wonderfully done and that are so productive and necessary, and they make me blush. Also, finally, one thing that I have to note here that the author addresses also is that Islamic law is actually very complicated, both in practice and in theory. So even as the scholars are creating all these 
in many cases, very strict rules and guidelines, they weren't necessarily applied in practice. But today's Muslims have a very, very problematic, and I want to say simplistic idea of Islamic line. It's kind of a problem. All right, so I'll stop here. Next up is a summary of chapter five, which is on same-sex relations in Islam. Thank you all for watching. Please stay kind and stay feminist, and I'll see you next time, inshallah. Salam.